Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to this week's episode of the Niche Cash Variety Show. We're from the Niche Cash, the niche-cash.com, and fresh off our subscriber podcast kōrero, which is sent out to the Patreon whānau and those who have subscribed on Substack, the paid subscription. We did talk about some Warriors versus Dragons, but we also did our weekly, at this stage, Black Caps conversation. And I am curious, Nico, the wild card, just to start us off, get the get the lotion for the motion and the motion and the lotion. What's just your Black Caps World Cup first 11 right now? Like, can you just drop some names off the top of your dome and just let's build out a World Cup, World Cup, Black Caps World Cup first 11 hard and fast right now? Uh, well, I suppose you've got Finn Allen and Devin Conway opening. Um, just have to think about the, the three, four, five because Mitchell and Phillips are going to be there. Um, don't know, does Will Young come straight in for Williamson or do you slide in, um, uh, maybe Mitchell up the order or something like that. Latham will be batting at five, so maybe you do. Uh, but you might also want Phillips at six in the absence of of a uh, Michael Bracewell. I do think certainly the bowling lineup is quite settled. I think you just go Santner, Sodi, uh, Henry, Salvi, Bolt. There's five excellent bowlers right there. Um, were you leaning on on the with the batting lineup? How would you fill that out? Well, so we got five bowlers. We got Alan Conway, Mitchell Phillips, Latham, five batters. I think you can add Will Young there. So I'd go Alan Conway and just slide everyone down the yeah. Alan Conway, Will Young, Daryl Mitchell, Tom Latham, yep. Glenn Phillips, then Santner, Sodi, Henry, Salvi, Bolt. There we go. That is something we are developing ahead of the... That team uh, can win a World Cup. Definitely can. We're developing it ahead of the World Cup. Updated now with uh, no Michael Bracewell that we've known about for a few weeks. So you can digest such yarns on our subscriber podcast delivered to the Patreon whānau and the Substack paid subscribers. They are the best ways to donate and support the Niche Cache directly. The links are everywhere you need them to be. And... It'll be a big help if you subscribed on YouTube and if you followed us on Twitter. Um, we've got the clips on Instagram. we got the clips on the YouTube shorts. You can go to our website, thenish-case.com. If you're still checking it out, the old Facebook, you can do that thing as well. The best thing to do is probably subscribe on YouTube and do a free subscription to Substack because if you sign up to our email newsletter coming out every Monday and Friday evening you just get the niche case sent straight to you so you don't need to do anything else you get all the podcasts sent to you you get all the links to our big yarns on our website the niche-case.com and you get specific yarns many of which show up in the variety show on or through our email newsletter especially on a Monday Big Aotearoa Sporting Times at the moment. Lots of fun stuff happening. We got some good performers. We got some stinky performers, but it's all quite fun at the moment. But we need to start with mindfulness. What do you got? Yeah, bit of Heraclitus for you, who said the way up and the way down are one and the same. That is like a, um, that's a big dose of Aotearoa vitamins where you just like inhale and you're just like, holy shit, what's happening? And then you exhale and you're like, holy shit, what's happening? Um, up and down, same way around. I'm not sure what to make of it. Yeah, I mean, there's easy sporting connotations there, isn't there, about like, um, teams on the rise and teams tumbling down and, and whatever. I uh, I mean, I I rewrote Scarface a few weeks ago and uh, that, sprung, that springs to mind as well when you think of like the, the way that, because that's what the whole story about is like the rise and fall of a um, 1980s Cuban-American Al Pacino. <laughs> um, but it's like, 
the the way he toppled people to get to the top is also the same way that he himself gets toppled later on in the in the um in the movie as well and i think that's i don't know but and then you know there's it's, it's also a nice lesson to keep in mind if you are on the way up you know do do so smoothly um be be kind to people on your way up rather than stepping over them because if you find yourself on the way back down they're a lot more likely to help you out later on if you were nice to them earlier rather than you know stomping all over them they're just going to stomp on you back when you come tumbling back i guess that's also another thing of that isn't it it's like impermanence you know you just the, the way up also isn't a permanent thing you don't just keep going up yeah you, you go up and then you come down and then you go back up and then you come down again from season to season <laughs> I was thinking like just trying to stay, you know, the mellow vibe, you know, not getting too high, not getting too low. Definitely that too. Yep. But coming into my leading banger for the variety show this week, definitely on the up with the Aotearoa Warriors because the Aotearoa Warriors, they are mindfully snatching souls. They are soul snatchers. They are destroying the the mana of opposition NRL teams right now. And this comes after a victory over your Dragons. It was a fantastic Warriors performance. In fact, it was the third game in a row the Warriors have scored over 30 points. That's pretty impressive. Especially considering in the first 12 games, they only scored 30 plus points twice. 12 games, two of which they scored 30 plus points. Now they have scored 30 plus points in three games in a row. Now that's cool. That's great. That's winning, that's winning rugby league, climbing up the NRL ladder. But the manner, the mahi in these victories is soul snatching. Dolphins came across to Aotearoa in the contest for 40 minutes. Warriors, turn it up a notch, soul, snatched, get back on the plane, see you later, lose a few more games, might I add. Go to Canberra Raiders. We all know what happened in Canberra, and that was the definition, that was the epitome of soul snatching. Oh, you've got a celebration. Oh, your hometown hero, he's playing 300 games. We're going to rip you apart. We're going to snatch your souls. They did it. Then you go to the Dragons, the Dragons, big home game. They're looking for a bit of positivity, a bit of, bit of trying to raise their mana after us during some turmoil. What do the Warriors do? Yeah, we'll give you a sniff. We'll give you a sniff, but then Dylan Walker's going to come on the field. We're going to throw the footy around, and we're going to snatch your souls. We're going to rip you apart through the middle. That's why Dylan Watanese Lesniak scores four tries. See you later. So you got Warriors are winning, but they're also snatching souls. That sounds a bit aggressive. That sounds a bit, you know, destructive. So we've got to put a positive flavor on it. The Warriors are mindfully snatching souls in the NRL. What's your leading banger? Yeah, the Tall Ferns, they beat South Korea at the Asia Cup in their, in their opening game. I wouldn't say they snatched any souls in doing so, but they certainly threatened to at the start. This is, frankly, like, honestly might be the best Tall Ferns win for like a decade this, this is a big deal this 66 64 but against a team ranked considerably higher than them i like grain of salt with the world rankings but south korea are about 12 or something and i think the tall firms are 29th and there was a bit of a gap also south korea are the fourth ranked team um fourth highest ranked team at this asia cup and the tall firms are trying to get into the top four to continue their um their Olympic qualifications. So this is frankly the perfect start. And they started amazingly. They they scored the first eight points, just energy effort, really disrupted what Korea were trying to do inside and outside. Um, Panina Davidson, absolutely immense, guarding up against six foot six Park Chi Su, who has played a, a fair bit of um WNBA in the past. He's a very good player and the sort of star player for for Korea. Davidson just like, I won't say shut her down or anything because you can't shut down a player that good, but she played every single second of the game despite having the toughest matchup on the floor. Benita Davidson, unreal. She led scorers as well for the for the Tall Ferns. Brilliant. 
Um, they flew out to a lead as big as 23 points in the first half when things were really sizzling, but South Korea did adjust things in the second half. Bit of zone defense, bit of speed and transition, really rough things up. They tied it up, three minutes 30 to go, and frankly, I've seen a lot of these type of performances, particularly at big tournaments, where it's like the Kiwi underdog team starts really well, great first half, doesn't quite have the juice in the tank to outlast the better team over the over the full course. Felt like this one was going that way, particularly when South Korea went on a little 9-0 run to tie things up. But they never led at no point. They, they might have tied things up, but then, you know, Charlie Sledger Walker responds with a two. And then Korea ties it up again. Crystal Ledger Walker gets to the line, scores a couple. Um and that led us down into the final minute where Crystal Ledger Walker and Panina Davidson both had absolutely clutch rebounds in the last minute. New Zealand won it thanks to that crunch time hustle. Very good habit to have. That is how you win close games. It wasn't a close game through the first half. They were way up. But then after having that lead evaporate, they still managed to find the, the gas in the tank there. Um, 24 points, 10 rebounds, 3 steals for Davidson. Outstanding. Like a legendary performance there. Chris uh, Charlize led your walk. Cool. 20 points. On, I think 21 shots force things up when they're really collapsing the um, the thing on you and your team struggling to score. You got to take on that responsibility as the key player. And and Charlize was it was excellent at that. Tara Reid as well, 14 points. Can't can't overlook that. Um, and what this means now is that their top four goal is extremely attainable because with this they can finish second. Even they play tonight against China, they'll probably lose to China because China are the best team at this Asia Cup. It's going to be China and Australia probably because the thing is in Sydney, probably China and Australia competing for the title. Uh, so, it But they play China tonight. It doesn't really matter if they win that. Then they're in, on course to finish first in the group, which goes straight through to the semifinals, in which case, beauty, like mission accomplished already. Probably not going to happen, though. However, they'll still likely finish second with a win over Lebanon, uh, which is who are the lowest ranked team at the, at the tournament, and therefore one they should beat. And that is a huge difference when it comes to the crossover game where two plays three and three plays two for the second for the other two spots in the semifinals, that is a massive difference because it'll mean you're either playing Chinese Taipei, aka Taiwan, or the Philippines, instead of probably playing Japan, who are likely to finish second in the other group. Like that's a massive difference. That's the difference between being underdogs again by even more than they were against South Korea, and the difference between being favorites as they would be against Taiwan or Philippines. So, you know, when that crossover game and they'd make the semis, that would accomplish their best ever Asia Cup finish at their fourth attempt. They finished fifth twice. They finished sixth once. They're trying to finish fourth this time. That would accomplish that. And top four also means they progress in Olympic qualifying. So pretty much the perfect start for the Tall Ferns at the Asia Cup. My second thing from the Aotearoa Sporting Weekend follows on from the Warriors Snatch and Souls because... The biggest thing I think a lot of Warriors fans or casual NRL fans are not aware of is the depth that the Warriors are brewing. Now, this is most evident in the NRL team. You've got backups in every position. Now, some of those backup players weren't even playing New South Wales Cup this weekend, like Tain Tuaupiki, backup fullback. He wasn't playing. Ali Liatawa one of the backup centers, along with Viliami Vailea, so you got two backup centers, that seems decent. Ali Leotawa was not playing. Dimitrik Sifakula wasn't playing, backup forward. And Salumiela Halasima, of still at school fame, he wasn't playing for New South Wales Cup either. So the Warriors New South Wales Cup team were missing three lads who have played NRL and I've got him as the best youngster in New South Wales Cup, Halasima. So you're missing four really good New South Wales Cup players. Ed Cosey was playing. He's a backup winger. So we've got a backup winger. That's great. The thing about that Warriors New South Wales Cup performance, they did lose to the Dragons. So shout out to your Dragons. They did get a New South Wales Cup win in Auckland. Hey. <laughs> but the young players for the Warriors playing, you had Zion Maiu'u and Isaiah Wagner joined by Solomon Vasuvulangi. All of th all three of them forecast forward as NRL prototype middle forwards. They're really aggressive, they're big, they're mobile, and they will be playing NRL footy fairly soon, I believe. Jacob Laban, 
he is a he's a prototypical NRL edge forward who played SG ball earlier in the season, now playing New South Wales Cup, now starting New South Wales Cup games as someone who is eligible for under-19 SG ball. Hold on a second. The Warriors had a few more of those lads because Tanner Stowers-Smith, Etuati Fukafuka, and Eddie Eremia were all playing New South Wales Cup as SG ball lads. So they were under-19 SG ball. Now they're playing against men in New South Wales Cup. And this was a notable game for Eddie Iramia, who was making his New South Wales Cup debut. He is out of De La Salle College, like a lot of the uh, best talent at the moment, the rugby league talent in the Warriors system. He started the... He was playing SG ball. He was playing edge forward for SG ball. Then he was playing Fox, um, like, qualification for Otara. Like, he was... Then he moved to Howick because Howick qualified for Fox Premiership. So a couple of the Warriors SG Ball lads moved from Otara to Howick to make sure they were playing Fox Premiership. And he was playing edge forward for Howick. He made his New South Wales Cup debut through the middle. And guess what? He's big. He's mobile. He's aggressive. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight young forwards in the Warriors system who all have NRL styles to their game. They're big. They can move, they can groove, and they're going to smash you. Let alone Leotawa, Tuaupiki, Ed Kosi, and those backup dudes like Freddie Lassick, Ronald Volkman, Tamari Martin hasn't even come back yet. You know what I'm saying? Warriors have some depth, but most importantly, all of this depth, they look like NRL players. And not many people know about them. So if you're a keen Warriors fan, you should be learning about these dudes because they are really good rugby league players. What do you got? There was an NBA draft on, on Friday afternoon. And I sat there watching quite a bit of it while I was working, trying to see where old Ryan Repair would pop up for the you know, Breakers next star, the latest Breakers player looking to crack the NBA, the latest NBL player trying to trying to crack the NBA draft. And we talked about this a little bit in the podcast last week. Eh? Like, there was a bit of buzz about like where would he go? And there was a bit of fluctuation between some of the predictions. Quite a few of them seem to have him going sort of early 20s, which is kind of what we've been assured the whole way through the season. We we're told by the by the scouts and by the NBL media that this dude is a first round draft pick. Um, I did wonder, I was like keeping a close eye, Brooklyn Nets, Sean Marks had both the 21 and the 22 pick, and I thought maybe there's a, there's an opportunity for him, didn't happen, and I think the reason it didn't happen is quite an obvious one, is because if you look into draft, you're probably trying to pick up players who aren't just the same but worse of what you've already got, you want, you want a little bit of variety in your squad, you're trying to find new talents, um, and new angles to, to play on the park. And what do the Brooklyn Nets have right now? Well, they don't have Kyrie Irving. They don't have Kevin Durant. But what they do have is a whole lot of players who are better versions of what Ryan Repair already is, which is a, you know, a, a strong wing defender who pro probably develop into a good shooter. Isn't quite there yet, but will probably develop into a good shooter. He's got a nice sort of, um, he's got a nice stroke, as they say. So that didn't happen. And Sean Marks might have popped by to personally scout him at one point, or at least to watch, just maybe just wanted to watch a Breakers game. I don't know. But um, maybe he was scouting Modi Mayor. Who knows? But he did watch a repair game in person, but he didn't draft him. In the end, repair drops all the way to 43, which was you know, mid second round. It's a lot less than what we were told to expect. Um, Though the fact that we know now that one of the main scouting dudes is actually on the payroll of the Breakers as an international scout is uh, maybe puts that into a little bit of a context as to whether we should believe the hype. It also flows on to a, um, to a pattern which I've, I've repeated a few times, which is that these guys, these next stars that go to the NBL don't necessarily improve their standings. They're not getting drafted anywhere higher. They might end up being better players. That's a different thing, but they're not getting drafted higher because they played nbl um this is just another example of that however ryan repair to portland trailblazers i don't know that's that, that that's not a bad fit for him it is a particularly interesting one because portland if they do trade damian lillard 
suddenly they're probably going heavy rebuild mode. They did pick up three. Like he was the third guy that they um, picked up in the draft. They, I don't know if they had any picks after him. I didn't check, but they got Scoot Henderson at three and Chris Murray in the sort of 20 odd range. So they've picked up a couple of first rounders. Ryan repair looks like a very good sleeper for them. And yeah, if, if they keep Lillard and try to win stuff, then we're probably talking about G league for a year or two. Um, if they don't, that might suddenly give them an opportunity to go play NBA very quickly. Also, just a few spots after that, Mojave King, number 47, a pick that was owned by the Lakers but was traded to, had already been traded, I think, to the Indiana Pacers. Mojave King was born in Otero. He has an American father. He has a Kiwi mother. In fact, his whole um, his whole like maternal side of his family are Otago basketball legends. He does consider himself an Australian. He moved there very young. He he spent most of his life there. However, he did play one season for the Southland Sharks, so we can claim him as a New Zealand NBL to American NBA um, you know, pathway player. There's been a couple of those in the past. He's another one. He's also, despite the fact that he, you know, he's he's made it pretty clear he wants to represent Australia internationally, but he was still born here. And that makes him the fourth player to be drafted having been born in Aotearoa. So you've got Sean Marks, you've got Stephen Adams, you've got Mojave King, you've also got Aaron Baines. So actually two of the two of the four players to have been drafted having been born in New Zealand are actually Australians, which is a weird twist, but so it goes. Um, yeah, it's, Mojave King was at the, I think I think he was a next star for Cairns and then he switched to Adelaide or I might've got that the other way around. Um, and then he actually, his last year, he went and played G League Ignite. So he went and played in America to get closer. And it got him drafted. So fair play to him. The, the fourth New Zealand-born player to be drafted into the NBA, Mojave King. Will be interesting to see if a next uh, break, uh, player for the Breakers ever is ever drafted as high as the Breakers tell us they're going to be drafted. That would just That's how I'm going to view all these uh, future situations. My... I'll have to check what they said about Usman Dieng because he's the only one that didn't go like 10 plus places lower than we were told. My next Kiwi Sporting banger is the White Ferns. The White Ferns start their tour of Sri Lanka today, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, it's a ODIs are first. The first ODI, three ODIs, three T20s. Probably not going to be able to watch it anywhere in Aotearoa at this stage. The thing here that I'm curious about is spin bowling. The White Ferns have really good spinners. Amelia Kerr, Eden Carson, Fran Jonas, Lee Kasperick, and Susie Bates. Really good spin bowlers. How effective are they going to be in Sri Lanka? We have to wait and see. What about the Kiwi batters? Especially Susie Bates, Sophie Devine, Maddie Green, Amelia Kerr, uh, Georgia Plimmer, Brooke Halliday, Bernadine Bezodenhut. What are they going to do in Sri Lanka against a plethora of Sri Lankan spinners? Or am I just taking ideas from men's cricket into women's cricket where the whole game is different and spin's not even going to be that important because it's women's cricket? Just they play the game differently. The bowlers are slower. They have different skill sets. The batters have different skill sets as well. So I'm not only pondering about the White Ferns' quality of spin bowlers, the quality of their batting against Sri Lankan spin bowlers, I'm also pondering these very basic ideas about men's cricket that we automatically transplant into women's cricket, some of which are true, some of which don't end up being true and are just, uh, you know, gender stereotypes. Let's go there. What else you got for the Kiwi Sports smorgasbord? Well, uh, going on right now is the Oceania Under-19s Women's Football Championship. So it's a nice tournament. There's the under 19 Championship. There's a trophy on the line. It's also qualification for the Under-20 World Cup next year. So, um, you know, important areas for the New Zealand team who are over there. Won their first game 3-0 against host Fiji. And then won 11-0 against Papua New Guinea a few days later. Now, the first game I thought was kind of slack. They were, it was only 1-0 after about an hour, and they scored a couple of a couple of later goals from set pieces coming off goalkeeping errors. They didn't play very well against Fiji. Fiji hit the crossbar at one point. There were chances the other way. Um, 
and just really felt like they were playing quite a quite a like one note style where it was very um fiji had a high line and they just wanted to put the ball in behind the line and run onto it which turned it into less of a football battle and more of like an athletic battle and i don't know if you've ever seen fijian athletes in any sport they're, they're pretty good at that stuff so they were getting burnt for pace and strength and there was just 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 a frustrating game to watch because it's like they're, they're better than that you don't need to play that way however nothing to worry about got that one out of the way with first up it was you know it was the first game of the tournament they were playing against the host probably the next best team at the tournament it was it's, we will excuse that because second game against papua new guinea Everything that was wrong about the first game was right about the second game. They were they were passing, they were moving off the ball. It was overlaps. There was you know cutbacks and just inc- incisive stuff. It was great. They were six nil up after twenty one minutes, I think. And then Papua New Guinea actually subbed off their goalkeeper at the, like about five minutes after that. Uh, it cooled down after that. You know they they. Um, less that the kiwis took their foot off the pedal and more that i think papua new guinea were just like okay damage limitation let's sit back uh, make sure we got a back four and a sweeper and really just you know let's not let them run rampant so it goes but you know fantastic performance for an 11 to win that actually puts them into the knockouts already because that's the end of their group stage they're they're in a group that only has three teams so the other two teams are playing each other now they get six days off and then they come back for their you know might be quarterfinal so yeah, this is all all on track so far. Haven't conceded a goal. There is an 18 player squad there, and every single one of them has started a game, which means that I think uh, what four players have started both games. Everyone started at least one. So it will be very interesting to see how Coach Leon Burney considers his starting eleven for the knockout stuff, because I do think there's definitely a case to say that it's not, you know, it's a combination of those two 11s that that is the the peak for them a couple standout players from within this group less so about the first two performances but just from what i've seen from them overall in their careers to this point um helena errington definitely skillful midfielder a great passer um player of the day in the papua new guinea game she is with the wellington phoenix academy at the moment emma pinenberg very similar skill set maybe a little less well-rounded but also just a little bit better with that like absolute killer incisive pass she's actually at fire nord at the moment they haven't played for western springs um up to that point she's with the fire nord i think under 19s team another talented player and also the fact that the first two players i mentioned are skillful technical midfielders tells you a lot about the direction of kiwi footy ruby nathan as well um from auckland united and then nochaka and a couple more wellington phoenix academy players although neither of them from wellington region um amy feinberg Danielli, the goalkeeper and Manaya elliott as well who's a right winger slash right back there's yeah the the five picks i'd, I'd say from that squad but we'll see what happens over the rest because there's plenty of plenty more candidates when you've scored 14 goals in two games I'm going to enter the battling zone. Lydia Ko and the Black Sticks are both battling at the moment. I, I'm far more chill about Lydia Ko's battles because she had a big year last year and she's just cruising through 2023. She had a tied 57th result last weekend um, and she has not finished better than tied 30th for the last seven tournaments. Um last five tournaments she's missed the cut twice and she's got two more results worse than tied 40 so she is battling the black sticks are also battling they had four losses in the pro league over the weekend i think they lost again this morning um and the men are certified ninth with a negative goal difference of uh, a goal difference of negative 31 the women are eighth and they've got a goal difference of negative 25 so they are competing for the the worst goal difference between each other as well which is a fun little battler tale what else you got just a few um a few bullet points from the nbl notebook which is just that was like honest great great competition just such a good competition it's on a great times just games through a Thursday through to Sunday nights. It's um, high quality basketball as well. We had a fantastic one on last, was it, I think it was last Thursday, wasn't it? The Webster brother derby. So the, the debut for Corey Webster for Canterbury and Ty Webster for Otago. Incredible game in which Canterbury were 30 to 12 up after the first quarter. 
and lost by double digits. Um, Ty Webster definitely got the better of the of the um, the brotherly matchup with twenty eight points, six rebounds, six assists, eight of fourteen field goals, which included some main threes, which really helped swing the momentum as Otago. Um, Turned a bit of a corner there because Ty then followed that up in a win over Hawks Bay Hawks with 19, 10, and 4. Suddenly, Slump and Nuggets back in business. Uh, also was paying very close attention to the matchup between Callum McRae and Rob Lowe. McRae, the Nelson Giants big man, he's coming in just to uh, say big man. Big man is putting it lightly. He's huge. But um, him versus Rob Lowe, the, the MVP candidate, the same position points towards the master on that one you know <laughs> mccray has been brilliant in this first couple of games for nelson but low and the tortada are just rolling right now rob low in that matchup at 25 points 11 rebounds three assists mccray only had three rebounds and i will be shocked if that is not a season low for him by the end of the campaign that means eight wins in a row for the tortara they're marching on towards what i assume we can just call the minor premiership um Although Franklin keep rolling as well. Their, their only recent loss was to the Tuatata, and they've been beating everyone else. They beat Wellington Saints on the back of a career-high 31 points from Dan Fotu, finally giving us that that performance within that like breakthrough performance at this level. We've been waiting to see from him. But the funkiness in the NBL is at the bottom of the ladder because six teams make the finals. The top two go straight to the semis. The next four play off to see who plays those two in the semis, which means six out of ten teams make the finals. The top five looks pretty set. The next five, well, let's just put it this way. The bottom five teams in the competition all have five wins. Some have three games to go. Some have four games to go. But they're all incredibly on equal points heading into the last three rounds of the competition. So it's it's anyone's game right there for that final final spot. My last thing here is just uh, setting the table for the Kiwi County Tour where we've got a nice battle between Daryl Mitchell, Will Williams for Lancashire. They're coming up against Tom Latham and Surrey. That game is going on at the moment. We also had Matt Henry, Enners. He took six wickets for Somerset, which was uh, fantastic from him. And we've got the inclusion of Ray Tool who is a central lefty seamer, and he's basically replacing Ajaz Patel, the central lefty spinner. Uh, you've also got Matt Quinn, you've got Doug Bracewell uh, as other players in the Kiwi County Tour, but we've got the Lancashire versus Surrey game is massive. Oh, and Henry Shipley playing for Sussex as well. He took two wickets in that first innings. And Matt Henry. Matt Henry is just dominating county cricket at the moment. He isn't scoring as many runs right now with the massive monster strike rate as he was doing earlier in the campaign, but he's certainly taken a lot of wickets. And if you know anything about Matt Henry, bowling in county championship cricket, he absolutely loves a baggie of wickets. And that's what he's doing at the moment as well. What's your last uh, Aotearoa sporting take here? Bit of Marco Stamina here because it is, you know, the, the end of the month, Contracts run out at um at various European clubs and also I think A League clubs at the same time. So we'll see how that goes. So there's definitely a lot of transfer business. I've been mentioning this in Flying Kiwis and and some of the all white stuff as well. And um, football firms will be in the same bag, except it'll have to wait till after the World Cup because that takes priority. A lot of transfers coming up, but not quite yet. However, there is one that is even though we've known about it since January, I, I really think this one needs a little bit of more emphasis and we're squeezing in at the end of the podcast here. Marco Staminage to Kravena Zvezda, aka Red Star Belgrade, the top team in Serbia. It is the land of his father. So there's definitely a bit of you know, similar to Marco Rojas going to Chile. There's there's a bit of um you know personal heritage at stake here and and connecting with um some of his bloodlines, which is beautiful, but also Champions League football, because Serbia, um, Serbia, is, Serbia is a strong nation for football, and and uh, Red Star are the dominant club in that league. They've won, I think, six or seven league titles in a row. Um, I think it's seven of the last eight. They, thanks to the increasing um, UEFA coefficients, they now don't even have to qualify because the top spot in Serbia goes straight through the Champions League group stage, which hasn't been the case in the past, which has been a struggle for them because uh frankly as much as this team dominates their domestic league their european stuff just hasn't been quite as good they haven't won a, a knockout um tie in the europa league 
since it became the Europa League, they they haven't done anything in the rare times they've made the Champions League group stage. And yet last year, they won their domestic season by 22 points clear of the second team. They've actually had two of their last three or four seasons. I think they've gone through undefeated as well. So they're too good for their own country. Therefore, the focus is very much on Champions League, European football, which was an immediate emphasis they made when Marco Staminich was unveiled there this week, is that this guy has played Champions League. He played in a, he started in a nil draw against Manchester City. He went on to win the tournament um, when he's playing with Copenhagen last year. He has been given the number six jersey, which sounds like a good one. You know, that's a starting 11 kind of number. He apparently had better offers from elsewhere in terms of financials, but chose this one as A, the sort of personal touch, but also you know, an opportunity to play Champions League to progress his career. Um, there was a quote from one of his advisors in the thing saying that he's sort of, uh, you know, this time, there's time to go to one of the big five leagues later on. He'll, he'll sign a four-year contract and he'll only be 25 when it ends. And because European leagues are just one season crammed on top of the other season, he's only just got back. He's only just finished one a season with um, Copenhagen, then went away with the All-Whites. And he's already played a preseason friendly for Red Star Belgrade. So there you go. And he started it too. So it's good signs there for Marcus Stamanich. Musical Jam. There isn't that too many new tracks that I'm listening to. So I was thinking like, what's, what can I do for Musical Jam here? And I just, there's two songs that I can never really get out of my head at the moment. They're just too catchy. They're just well, far too catchy, uh, but it's a good thing. And the first one is No Worries, which is Knowledge and Anderson Park, their song Daydreaming. You listen to that, you'll be humming along for at least a couple of weeks. And then another one, bit of an older song from uh, earlier in the year, Tyler, the Creator's Wharf Talk. Still can't get that one out of my head as well. So there you go, a couple catchy jams, No Worries, Daydreaming, and Tyler, the Creator's Wharf Talk. Just pure catchy jams to chuck on and keep listening to. What about yourself, Musical Jam? Yeah, a uh, new album from Corey Hansen. It's fantastic. I I really dug his last album. He's um, the front man from a Californian psych band called Wand, who's sort of on that kind of like Ty Siegel periphery crew um, OCs and them, which is very much, very much in my style. Um, and yeah, his latest one has definitely got some of those Neil Young crazy horse vibes real shredding in a, in a couple of them tunes. Also had longer to sit with the Jason Isbell album. Um, and I liked it at first. Now I've listened to it a couple more times and now I think it's up there with the best stuff he's done. It's fantastic. Just no one writes a song as good, as poignantly, as as sort of powerfully as that dude does. Best in the business. And also, you know, well, one local track I'll chuck in on top of that. Dart's got a new one. Um, the band from Wellington, New Zealand, is as their first album was called. His first single, I think, I think first single since their debut album came out last year. And it's called DMC. And it's just another one of their sort of like ravaging punk rocker type things about the about the art of the deep and meaningful conversation after a night on the piss you know is Did you... something we've all experienced have you watched the video i have where it's like um a white powder sh sh like sped up into changing into the lyrics it's creatively and done a whole lot of aotearoa vitamins you got the actual aotearoa vitamins <laughs> yeah. and then you got the aotearoa um synthetic medicines as well so shout out darts shout out aotearoa big up yourself we'll be back on thursday with a big episode of the niche cast kia kaha stay beautiful chur chur